morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, colleagues and family. Good morning. Good morning, our Empower Our community. We're so excited to have you all here today. And for our last episode of season three of 2023, um, and the continuation basically of our previous episode around AI, um, harnessing generative AI for transformative education. And I am just so very excited that we have uh, my colleague back here, my partner in crime, in all crimes, and we give a lot of frustrations to many. <laughs> Uh, to have my colleague back to actually speak to us more about um, AI in education, particularly looking at various topics around personalized learning, automated content creation, data privacy and ethics, collaboration, the real world issues and cases around it as well. And also looking around the technological barriers that we also experience with regard to AI. One thing that we have to also mention is, um, Yaku, I was telling him, I don't have a bio for you. He tells me wing it. I should know him by now. But he doesn't realize that he's such an all around dude that it gets a little bit tricky to just wing it with Yaku. Um, he sent me a whole list of his studies and his honors in CIE, Computer Integrated Education, that he's currently busy with still, um, having taught at Worcester Gymnasium, um, being back and forth. Um, and also wanting to be a rock star in his lifetime. I think he's he's heading still in that direction. <laughs> and one thing that's also super a, a superpower of Yaku that everybody knows is that he has got a black belt in Google Sheets. And all honesty, guys, he's got a major black belt in AI, understanding AI, and also within education as well. So we are only starting this major conversations around AI. We know that it's a trend setting word right now. It's everywhere, everywhere we get to go with it. There's a lot of it. It came forth last year. I mean, AI is exactly about a year old. ChatGPT is a year old now, Yaku, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. Yeah, so just the idea that ChatGPT is a, a year old, and when it came out, we thought, oh, everything's going to change dramatically. Every, we're going to shift everything now, and now things have somewhat distilled and more things are coming in and we are now trying to navigate our way through it and how do we actually connect our our line of thinking in terms of curriculum development pedagogy all of that within the ai structures and frameworks so i'm going to hand over to my colleague yaku i'm really excited to hear um, what the next step around or the next conversations are around ai in particular and I'm sure everyone here will also benefit tremendously from this opportunity and this conversation. So, Yaku, my buddy, Thank over you. to you. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Just want to double check. You can hear me, right? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Awesome, awesome. Right. Um, I just want to. Yeah, because just a second, screen. I just want to say, everyone in this group, please message your colleagues and friends and tell them, hey, you're missing the Empower Hour. I know it's a crazy time of the year as well. Um, and we shifted it because of a lot of conflicting priorities. But just message your colleagues that you know will be super interested in this to come into our session right now. Um, the link is still in the calendar as well. Thank you, Yaku. Over to you. Okay. I'm just going to hit the record button, Hafisa. It is recorded, Yaku. Oh, is it recording? Yes. Okay, sorry. I, I didn't realize <laughs> that. Right. So let me just quickly share my screen. Um, and then we're going to get. Going right. <clears throat> so, this is a continuation of the conversation that we had um, in the last Empower Hour, um, where we kind of just talking about where are we now with this whole AI thing? Have things changed? What have we necessarily learned in the past? Because I think. Um, Khafisa has not seen what my presentation is going to be about at all, and she actually really hit uh, the, 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 the nail on the head with a lot of the, the comments that she made there. It really ties in nicely to what I want to talk about today. Um, so I, I don't think it's really necessary for us to go into what generative AI is anymore. By now, we really should be have an understanding of it. And you'll see where, where I want to go with this. One of the things that, that I think is important to take note of, ChatGPT, which is the thing that's kind of captured everyone's imaginations, 
was released at, in, uh, on the 30th of November um, last year. So it's almost a year old. Just a week, we're just a week early with this one, but it's 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 incredible the kind of way that it captured people's imaginations. In our last session, I I, I linked it to the whole thing. It was happening um, in the 90s around these chess playing artificial intelligences and how that was going to change everything. And guess what? This is what people said. It is going to completely disrupt the educational system. People also said the technology will evolve faster than teachers, professors, and school managers can anticipate. AI will replace teachers quicker than we imagine. This is what people were saying early on in this year when this thing came out. People were saying this is just this is a complete game changer. And I just want to quickly run a poll that I have over here. Um, <clears throat> that I set up beforehand, just to get a sense of the people in this session. So, how often do you use generative AI? Just out of curiosity, those people that are in the session, um, do you use it every day? Do you use it once a week, once a month maybe? You've used it once or twice. Let's see what your what your general response is to this. All right. So we've got three people who responded. Two of you are five responses. So we've got three people that use it every day, two people that use it every week. A lot more people responding. The less the daily thing is, is going there once or twice. It feels, it feels that our poll is really following the chat GPT vibe of the super enthusiasm we started with in the beginning is slowly waning as more people are responding to the question. And I think. We this this to me is quite interesting because the people that are in this session are not necessarily a good representation always of the general education um, sector out there because we are people who have joined an empower hour session about AI. We are naturally more curious about AI. So you would imagine if this thing is as disruptive and as as completely um, life changing as people are saying. Surely later that should be much closer to 100% of us using it on a daily basis. Um, I use it almost every day for various things. Um, and I'm sure others also use it. Use it. I know um, some of my colleagues are using it on a very regular, regular basis. Um, so what is the narrative out there? And this is still the narrative out there. This has been the narrative out there for the last year. If you go onto YouTube, which is where a lot of people are getting the information, especially about things like AI, what do we see? We see things like this, navigating the AI revolution in education. We see things like this, 11 of the best AI tools. Now, I find it crazy that you're going to tell someone how to use, um, how to use 11 tools in six minutes. That just doesn't make complete sense to me, but okay. Let's just go with it. 11 tools in six minutes. Then seven AI tools for students in 10 minutes because we need to be mindful of this. This is for teachers and this is for students. It's not only for one of the two. It can be used for both. And then kind of the more ominous ones we'll also get. Are we prepared for the AI revolution? And then, of course, AI will teach kids. These are some of the narratives that are out there um, that, that, that is driving the conversation. And at this point in time, I think if there's one thing that I really hope that you take away from this, because we are just doing another one of these. We're just making it a little bit longer. Um, also talking about AI. The, the thing that we should take away from this is it is an important conversation that we should be having. I mean, it really is an important conversation. It's 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 not, I think, quite as revolutionary. Um, we'll get to that later on. But I think we have to also be mindful of who these people are that are driving this narrative. So these two that we see here at the top, um, they are just simply people that are cashing in on the situation. They're creating content on YouTube. 
they are be they they they're very excited to be able to monetize this because everyone's watching their videos. You can't teach people how to use AI tools, eleven AI tools in six minutes. All you can do is you can show them, and chances are very good that person showing them has probably not used any of them. They just kind of Googled them and found them and made a little video, makes lots of money. The ones there at the bottom, these are the ones that have been locked away in their dark rooms for the past 10 years, developing these AI tools. And now they're super excited to be on stages talking about it. So they're just, they're just they're loving, they're loving the opportunity of being out there. And they're making big, bold, crazy statements at times. Um, so they are the ones driving the narrative. But just to take you back a long time ago, well before I was born, in the 1950s, TVs were supposed to replace teachers and revolutionize education. The American education system pumped millions and millions of dollars into getting TVs into all classrooms. They had a huge program going around where they said, we are going to find the very best teachers out there. We will record them teaching a lesson. And then we will play those lessons in, in classrooms across America. And this will revolutionize education. We're going to find, because this is great, we're going to have one teacher teach hundreds of learners, how, or thousands, millions of kids, the best ones out there. That's going to really change things. Seemed like a great idea in the 1950s. Fast forward 70 years later. We kind of tried similar things to this in a way with live streaming. Um, we we also had our, we kind of I think had similar types of um, bumps and bruises along the way. But I read a study on this on this thing um, a while ago, and I find it fascinating how when they try to determine what why it didn't work, why it didn't revolutionize, this was what they found. Rather than enhancing and extending the good things already happening in the traditional classroom, instructional television mirrored classroom teaching practices, replacing the classroom teacher with a televised version. And that's why it failed. Because it was not trying to be, and this is something we talk about in the e-learning space all the time, it was not trying to be something that is infused into what is already working. They tried to use it as something to replace what they thought wasn't working well enough. And that's why it didn't work, because it's not being infused and added onto good practice. It's trying to replace something. Now, I think this is an important thing to, to take note of, because if we go to this previous statement where they say that AI will replace teachers, sounds very similar to what they said about TVs. And I have a strange suspicion that the result if you're going to try and do that, will be very similar to what we found with TVs. So this is a part of the conversation we need to be very, very, very mindful of. We need to consider consider this way, as we are moving forward with AI, as we are moving forward with thinking about how we're going to integrate artificial intelligence. So we decided we're not going to go and just listen to the hype. We want to ask our teachers what they thought so what we did is we created this what you see at the bottom this Miro board um, which we then sent to our transformation agents these are the teachers who are actively involved in facilitating e-learning developmental sessions they are actively involved in in um, helping us craft content for for e-learning these are these are our teachers who are at the forefront of the e-learning um, of the e-learning wave, the ones that are carrying this e-learning torch in our schools, just to find out what they had to say about it. Um, just to, I'm not going to go into detail yet because I would be able to go and zoom into all of these little comments, etc. But that's going to take way too long. So what I did is we took, we basically took what they said on this board. And we broke it, we gave them five topics, and we wanted to get a breakdown of what they are saying is happening at school level. Because it's one thing if a university professor in America is talking about AI, it's an entirely different thing if a Western Cape Education Department teacher is telling us what they are doing with AI in their school, what their experience is, what their lived reality is. So 
we have to make it bring it home make it topical and see what what's happening what's happening here now the five categories we had and i ordered them i reordered them for this presentation in order of what i kind of want to say the most interesting to or sorry no, the other way around kind of the least interesting to the most interesting responses for me personally um these might not be necessarily the same you might look at them a little bit differently but they it'll all make sense in a minute so technological barriers what do they say about the technological barriers personalized learning automated content creation real world use cases which is the, obviously one of the one of the most important ones and i put the data privacy and ethics one right at the bottom because there's a couple of very interesting comments on that that I really want us to. Um, I, I'm very curious to see your responses in the chat on that um, when we get to that to see what your thoughts are on on those. And you're welcome to share the chat. I'll try and keep half an eye on that. Kafisa, you'll let me know if there's anything really important I need to pay attention to there, right? Absolutely. I've also indicated that they can ask questions in the chat. We can also cover it towards the end, or if there's yes, anything please. that's pertinent to that section, I will make you aware of it as well. Please raise awesome. your hand if anybody has a question. I will I'll open up your mic for you to be able to comment or to provide, um, or for you to ask your question. Right. And I, I will happily provide my opinion, but these are my opinions. I can't say I am... Professor called said I have a black belt in AI thing as well. I don't believe that necessarily, but um, I try to stay on top of these things, and it's an interesting conversation for me. So the technological barriers for me, and and I see there's quite a lot of e-learning advisors in 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 the session as well. See if you can spot similarities here. And this is when we talk about the technological barriers to AI, learner devices, connectivity teacher proficiency when we talk about technology integration regardless of what it is this is what we this is what we get the other thing i didn't add in here is also just general technology so what the technological barriers our teachers are experiencing in our schools it's exactly the same as the technological barriers they're experiencing for anything else ai hasn't changed that thing for them necessarily the one thing that was highlighted more more distinctly, I think, than in um, than in some of our other cases, was that teacher proficiency, because it is obviously it's an it's a it's an area that is lacking when it comes to um, other other ICT integration as well. But there seems to be, from what we got from the response, a limited interest in actually thinking and talking and discussing about AI and the potential that it has. We, we remember what we said in the beginning, it's gonna revolutionize education, it's gonna change everything. It seems that a lot of the teachers just, when they say about teacher proficiency, you could just say, teachers don't care. A lot of them are not interested in this thing at all. Uh, so it's not the revolution, it's not changing everything like people, people expected it to. And this is what I feel kind of, this was pretty much expected. It wasn't that surprising what we got over there, the technological barriers. Personalized learning I found to be quite interesting because there's a lot of incredibly interesting things happening in AI and personalized learning. And the things that they came up with, content that can be shared individually. Like AI isn't doing that. We've been able to create content that could be shared individually for ages. This is not new. One of the teachers mentioned informative, they can use the ability to track what, how learners are answering questions real time, et cetera. But that's not an AI thing really. And this I thought was super. Someone mentioned Cami. Yes, Cami maths, Cami languages, good old Cami. When they talked about the fact that learners answer questions and based on their answers, they are then able to go to certain levels, higher or lower, et cetera, et cetera, that matches to their to their competency level. Remember, we're talking about something that's revolutionary, but the best thing that our teachers really could put out there in terms of wh where we've got personalized learning was Cami, which is a software that is definitely not new. What this tells me is from a personalized learning point of view, 
There might be things out there, but our teachers aren't really engaging with these things. Our teachers are aware of these things, but they're not really going in and looking at what it truly can do. The one thing that is, I think, a little bit different with a personalized learning thing is whenever we use a personalized learning platform, um, it becomes expensive because then we need to have, we need, people need to start paying for learner licenses and there's a whole lots of cost that is incurred. So personalized learning while impressive is not a, is, is, is a re relatively expensive um, avenue to go, to go down. I look at um, Khan Academy, for example, who are, who are developing great personalized learning tools, which is only available in the US at the moment, or last time I checked. Um, and it's, it's it, or what they what they're promoting. I've been able to look at it. I've seen the videos, etc. It sounds like a great concept. Kids watch videos. They answer questions. If they get things right, they go a certain path. They get things wrong. They go another path, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The and then you will be certain things will be suggested to you. It all sounds fantastic. Um, but again, it's not revolutionary. It's not new because Cami has been doing that forever. They're just kind of making it more shiny, I think, in a way. So we also need to be aware of everyone is slapping the AI label onto literally everything when they're making something digital. It's often not even remotely anything to do with AI. When I look at, I looked at um, a website the other day when they talked about AI enhanced um, slideshow templates. Like you open it up and it's just a slideshow template. And I'm asking myself, why is this AI enhanced? In what way are you saying this is AI enhanced? Did you use AI generated images for this? Because if you did, cool, it makes no real difference. This image that you see over here could have been generated by AI. I don't know. It's not adding necessarily much to what's happening. So um, I think we need to be careful with that whole AI thing that everyone just thinks anything digital is now AI. Um, because that dilutes the conversation around what AI really is. Right. Um, okay. So then we looked at automated content creation. Now things became a little bit more interesting. So people came up with a couple of good suggestions. This is not a session where we're going to have a look at 11 cool tools in six minutes. I'll mention these things and trusting that you have the ability to to, to just go and Google these things if you're interested. You'll go find out more about them. So Conquer is a very, very nice multiple choice question generation tool that some of our schools are using. One of our schools I know, is, um, they've gone and bought the license and this is pretty much getting integrated into everything that they do. Or well, this is at least the message that we've um, received. So great, cool multiple choice question generator. CuriPod, anyone's tried it? Also, quite an interesting curiosity, you can generate presentations with CuriPod. Um, well, specifically for, for classroom purpose presentations. It's got like interactive tools in, embedded into it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, with the look, see what it is. Interesting. Magic School. I didn't know Magic School until quite recently, but Magic School has got lots of very cool things. I just said lesson plans, but it can do so many things. That's the other thing that I've also picked up with these things. Everyone has realized that effectively what, what they're doing is they're kind of all doing the same thing now. And it's not very difficult once they're plugged in to some sort of large language model, because that's kind of what they do. Once they plug into a large language model, they can now start generating th all sorts of things for you. Magic School, as an example, um, I don't know why this thing is. It seems my license has expired, unfortunately. Um, Magic School, as an example, is basically just plugged into um, ChatGPT. So what what it'll do is it just kind of prompts ChatGPT for you. So when you say, when you click on one of the options that says, let's just go to it quickly to show you what it looks like. Um, so when I go to something like this, like Magic School, and I click on a quote of the day generator, then all that it's doing is it's prompting a large language model saying, please do the following X, Y, and Z. If I say, thank you, note generator, and I click on that option, um, then all that it's doing is 
I don't now don't need to describe what you're thanking the recipient for, um, forcing me to do another session on AI. This is directed at you, Hafisa. So, yeah, just click on that. Hey, just wanted to say thanks for pushing me to do another session on AI. I wasn't too thrilled about it at first, but I actually learned a lot and had a great time. Appreciate your encouragement. My absolute pleasure, Yaku. <laughs> right. So, so, um, so all that this is doing that you have to understand is it's pushing this thing into a large language model. Now, we've got ChatGPT over here. I would have been able to do exactly the same thing with chat with this one. So let's say I copy this, forcing me into doing all that all that that large language model has done. Um, all that thing has done is it put the prompt in front. Write a thank you note about forcing me to do another session on AI, and it might apply a couple of other filters to it. There we go. Dear name, I hope this message finds you well. And as we all know, ChatGPT is super wordy with everything that it says. The one thing I think is a little bit when I go back to um, to these options that we have, the one thing that I think is a little bit um, we need to be a bit hesitant sometimes with these things is it's it's taking away one of the really magical things about our generative text or generative um, tools because in that magic school I don't have the option to now go and prompt it to further prompt it. So in chat, if I go back to chat GPT, I can now say, shorten this and make it sarcastic. So now I've got this. I just wanted to send a quick note to express my overwhelming gratitude for pushing me into another riveting AI session because, you know, one session was just not enough excitement for a lifetime. Now imagine quickly, you are teaching languages and you're trying to get kids to understand what sarcasm is. I promise you, I've tried to do this. It's not always easy to do that because now I can do this. Now I can say, turn this into something that is written in old English. Let's see what it does with that. I doth extend mine humble gratitude unto thee for, com for the compelling of my unworthy self to partake in yet another session upon the mysterious realms of artificial. Okay, I'm not going to go through that whole thing. Um, no, that sounds like my emails. <laughs> <laughs> which is why ChatGPT is useful because I can then copy and paste Kafisa's emails into this and say, make it sound like a normal person. But the the bottom line is the magic of generative AI doesn't lie in the generation of the of what we are doing. It lies in the interaction that happens after that. Well, that's something that I'm discovering more and more as I'm going, going along with it. Because in that interaction, we actually we're learning a lot about the context. We're learning a lot about how to analyze something and how to understand whether or not it is appropriate. So that in itself is quite high on Bloom's taxonomy of skills, the ability to really reanalyze, understand, and determine whether or not this is going to work. So let's just go on to real world use cases. Now, these are some real world use cases. These are examples that teachers pointed out where they're using generative AI for. And Completely unsurprisingly, the number one use that is very clear across the board, they're using it to make their admin easier. They're using generative AI to write their newsletters. They're using generative AI to write their emails. They're using it to write their report card notes. They're using it for all sorts of things like that. One of the things that, that I think um, a lot of people like about Magic School, for example, and why I said this is when you're doing planning you can literally just say lesson plan generator click on the lesson plan generator and we'll say 11th grade i've said standards set to align to caps i don't know if it actually works but i'm just putting it there down because they say i can say 
when I don't put anything there, it says any standards worldwide. Super confident about that. Um, but let's say, let's pretend it works. 11th grade, um, what are you teaching? Shall I compare the to a summer's day? Right, let's see if it can generate that. I'm just clicking on generate. And there it's basically going to put together a lesson plan for me on shall I compare thee to a summer's day. Now, this is great, but again, for me, there's that, that second part that, that I think is sometimes standards assess, common core state standards. Yeah, thank you. That is definitely not CAP. So you lied about being able to set to any standard worldwide. Um, so there it's given me a, a basic lesson plan. But I'm also not really able to, I, know I, I haven't really tried this Ask Grainer, so maybe I can do that um, in the way that, that, that I'm doing it with ChatGPT. But we have, to, we have to kind of understand that these things are all being built on this large language model concept. And there's nothing wrong with using this. We just need to understand where it's coming from and that if you need to have it be more specific and play along to what you want it to do, then you might want to actually go and use the actual large language model and put that effort, make the effort of saying, um, write a lesson plan for teaching shall I compare the to a summer's day. But here's the key thing that people are getting wrong all the time. We need to provide as much context as possible. For a grade eight class, it's probably tricky for a grade, eight, well, we'll just leave it. For a grade eight class um, who are doing a Shakespeare poem for the very first time, 45 minutes, There are no, or well, let's say there are learner devices, learner devices, which should be incorporated. Right, so details. I'm giving it more details. So now it's going to give me all the things I need to do. Da, 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 it's breaking it down. No one said I have to do what it tells me to do. I think that's an important distinction we need to make. Give me a second. I just realized I have not plugged in my laptop, so it is slowly dying on me. So, Hafisa, do a song and dance quickly. Okay, you know I need my full set of my guitar and keyboards and everything if I'm going to do that, eh? <laughs> I need the music to completely drown out the sound of my voice. <laughs> Oh, there we go. I am exactly the same. I also just want to drown out my voice. It's much better that way around. Um, so teachers are using it for admin a lot because when they're using it for admin, it, it doesn't challenge us necessarily in how we are. It doesn't necessarily tell us how we are going to um, integrate it and, and change the way we're teaching. It's It's kind of like, I need to write the boring thing, just do it for me. I need to do this, just do it for me. Even those lesson plans, it's, it's a, I think it's a very valuable tool in that. But the, the challenging part is then we need to interrogate it. The way that someone explained it to me the other day is you need to, and, and the way we kind of looked at it in our, in our bigger session that we had, is you need to look at the AI bot and the AI tool as someone who is always willing to brainstorm with you. Now, in my case, I often brainstorm with Hafisa, but she's not always willing to, and she's not always available. And unlike ChatGPT, she often just says no. So ChatGPT, if I asked Hafisa, write a lesson plan for me, she would say no, I'm assuming. But if I asked ChatGPT, she does it. So the other thing that, that, that I saw in a video that we also need to keep in mind is these, these, these large language models do not understand context if you don't give them context because if i were to ask here's a simple example that they used if i asked someone let's say i ask hafisa hafisa will you please go buy me a cup of coffee and she goes out and 
it's closed. The, the, the coffee shop is closed. There's no coffee. She'll come back and she'll tell me, sorry, Aku, the coffee shop was closed because she comes with some context. Whereas if you ask an AI model and the AI tool, obviously they can't do it, but if they were able to do it, they'd go to the coffee shop. If the coffee shop was closed, they'd break it open and go in and make coffee for you and bring it back because they've received an instruction. They will complete that instruction. This is also why you always need to check the answers that they give you. Because if you ask it for an answer, it will try to give you an answer. When it's, when it's a specific thing that the guardrails are up and it knows it can't answer that, then it won't. But for some things that, where it doesn't quite know the answer, it'll actually make it up. Even if you're doing academic things with it, it'll make up names of people that wrote things that never wrote anything. So you always need to be a little bit hesitant with that. Um, so some of the cool things that have come out, I think, with the real world use cases that people are, are using, because it becomes so much easier to generate content, teachers are exploring the idea of differentiated learning through varied content types. Because with AI, I can now actually convert things or I can create new things very quickly, images, text, graphics, whatever. I can generate things well, graphics tech, anyway, you can generate things easier. So people are experimenting with this concept. Now that, now that, that, that um, our voice simulators, for example, are getting better, people are playing around with that more. In, one learner is better at reading things, another learner is better at just listening to things. You can run a text through an audio generator and generate an audio file and, or just use some tool that reads that text to a learner and they actually understand it better. So there's differentiated learning that we can do through varied content types. And that's quite an exciting and interesting thing for me. Um, what is this the, right. So feedback on writing for me is also quite, a, quite an interesting thing because this is going to lead nicely into our next question. Um, the ability to go and actually write, because this is what we do. If we're writing, if we're busy with a project and you write a paragraph, et cetera, et cetera. As a learner, you're sitting, you're sitting and you're not sure whether or not what you've written is good. So the only way to know whether or not it's good is you go ask your parents who might have no clue about what you are doing, um, especially as you're moving up in the grades. You could ask your teacher who is always too busy because we overload our teachers all the time. So they don't have time to give you feedback on your writing. They just mark it and give it back to you. So why aren't we just feeding, if we're learners and we want to improve, we feed our things into ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT, how can I improve? A lot of people will say, but that's alarm bells are ringing, that's cheating. Why are you allowing kids to put it through an AI system to improve? Isn't the whole point of what we're doing to try and get kids to improve? There's a difference between asking ChatGPT to write something for you writing something and asking ChatGPT, how could I improve this? Because there's a lot of effort that went into it from your end. And then reading the responses that you get activates your higher order thinking skills. It activates your critical thinking skills like very few other things we are doing um, at the moment. If you are doing something, you're getting instant feedback on that. And now you can action on that feedback to improve what you're doing. That is activating the higher order thinking skills, the critical thinking that we want to want to tap into more. So let it do it. Because unlike, as we just pointed out, I'll take Hafisa again. If I've written up a document, as I did yesterday, I sent it to Hafisa and I asked her for feedback. She gave, did she give feedback? I don't think she even gave me feedback. Thanks, Hafisa. But ChatGPT would never refuse. However, this is the problem again. That specific document that I wrote, if I fed that into ChatGPT, ChatGPT would, own, would not have understood any of the context around what that particular thing was about. So it would probably say, you can maybe write this sentence differently here, this thing differently there. But if we're doing projects about historical things, if we're doing projects about actual fact-based things that, that, need, that, that kids are doing in schools, there's no reason why AI can't add a tremendous value in helping them understand how to improve. Um, it's a fine line, though. But anyway, we'll get to that. 
this is an interesting thing uh, um, that I also thought, just as an example that, that one of the teachers pointed out that she's doing already, um, is basically getting the kids to train chat GPT, to train a chatbot by telling it. So as an example, let's try this. Um, you are William Shakespeare. I'm stuck with it. Greetings, kind, blah, 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 blah. Why did you write so many plays? So as an example, ah, oh, my dear inquirer, the quill danced upon the parchment driven by the muse's breath and the stage beckoned like a siren's call. I, William Shakespeare, do not merely put quill to paper. As Just as an example, what, what was... Um, Romeo and Juliet really about. So can you see how this is very different from what we normally have? Because I've actually now told ChatGPT, don't just respond to me, assume a certain persona. Now you can do the same thing. So let's say we are going to say you are a, um, a German girl in the 19, in, nine, in 1943, describe the atmosphere in your country. Right, I probably, so I probably should have first said the one thing, you are a German girl in 1943, stop there so that it assumes the personality and then start, so how do you feel? Do you understand how we can use this in a very different kind of way from what we've been, from, from just the way that we often use it? I think in that sense, where we are still stuck with a lot of generative AI is we're kind of using it like a search engine, which we, we just, like we would search for things on Google, we search for things in ChatGPT. We're not interacting with it. We're not having conversations with it. It's not a dialogue that is happening. And therefore, um, like it's doing great stuff for us, undoubtedly. It's doing very interesting things. But we, we're not quite moving forwards. And I think that is one of the next things, next steps we need to consider. Now, I left this last one for last because... Data privacy and ethics, it's plagiarism, right? So this was the biggest fear when ChatGPT started. Everyone said it is plagiarism, full stop. Like, it's, it's, how is it any different from plagiarism? One of the interesting things we need to consider is currently there's actually no solid ethical framework to help define, these are, quite, these are just stickies that I took straight off of the, the, the mirror board. There is no solid ethical framework to help define the parameters of plagiarism within AI usage. Plagiarism, as it is defined, is seen as using someone else's words. AI is not technically someone else, but it's also not your own. So it's in a gray area, which is causing a lot of confusion. Because at the same time as I just what I just pointed out to you, that you can you can get incredibly interesting contextually specific information from something like ChatGPT. You can also ask it to write your whole your whole question your, your whole paper for you, and just blindly copy and paste that. But the more you've played around with AI, the more you start picking up when it is AI. Because I mean, at the end of the day, it is it's it's kind of following the same the same general way of doing things. So so if you if anyone has played around, let me just quickly put it because I haven't really used the poll so much. Sorry, I'm focused on this side. Thumbs up, thumbs down if you agree with me. If you've played around with AI quite a bit, you can spot someone using AI in an email or a response or whatever. So. Thumbs up, thumbs down, if you agree with me. If you've played around with AI, most of the times you can actually spot AI. Right, so pretty much 
if most people are agreeing with me, there's one person who's disagreeing, it's fine. I think it's one of those cases of if we know this, if we know that most of the times when you play around with AI, you can spot AI, then the secret is play around with AI. The more you play around with it, the better you become at spotting it. I have another question <laughs> that I'm curious, and I'll, you can respond in the chat to this, because as a parent whose son is now going to grade R next year, I just looked at my colleagues and I was still teaching, and all these parents were writing all the kids' orals, and they were write, doing their, basically doing their projects for them, blah, blah, blah. None of that was supposedly cheating when the parents are doing the work for the kids. This was acceptable practice somehow. In fact, the kids who were doing their own work were struggling because their work was not, I mean, they are, they are nine years old. They will not be writing something at the same quality level as a much older person. So the question then is, why are we so freaked out about ChatGPT, which is in a way similar to that, going, hey, mom, can you help me with my essay? And then mom writes the essay for the kid. That is not good. But if you say, hey, mom, can you, can you help me write my essay? And mom says, yes, please write your essay, bring it back to me. I'll have a look and I'll give you feedback. It's exactly the same as what ChatGPT can do for us and what all of these large language models can do for us. The only difference is not all of our kids can go to mom to help, to help you. But if we create the environment, create the scenario, then all kids could potentially go to a large language model and ask it to help. Here's another very interesting point that, again, one of our, our um, transformation agents made. I'm going the route of allowing AI for projects. However, any statement or opinion must be backed up with credible data that is clearly referenced. This places the responsibility on the learner to properly digest and critically evaluate what AI has produced. And I love that concept because now the learner, again, using AI, but they are required to use critical thinking to, implement, to actually implement AI properly and effectively. Here's another question that we need to ask ourselves. If we are preparing learners for a world outside of school, for the future, then surely we should help them understand how to, how to leverage AI. It's the same argument as allowing a learner to use a calculator or not. AI is, like everything else, just a tool. If we learn how to use the tool correctly, we can get the most benefit out of it. If we use it, if you give someone a calculator and you put the calculator there and say, do math, it's going to not, it won't be able to. And ChatGPT and these generative models, they kind of are the same. If you don't understand how to prompt them correctly and well, and if you don't understand how to critically evaluate the information that it gives you, I mean, I will tell you now, unashamedly, that the topics that we gave to our teachers were 100% generated by AI. We asked AI, which questions should we ask our teachers? It gave us seven questions. We used our own critical um, analysis and we said, we're not going to ask those two. We'll take these five, we'll edit it a little bit, and then we'll ask it because we will be, then be able to get interesting information from them and weave a story that we can then share with you. But again, using AI is a useful thing, but I can't sit back and say, AI, make my hour long session for me. I will just read off of a script because I promise you, you would have picked up very quickly that this guy is literally just reading a script generated by ChatGPT. Um, so it's a funny thing and it's something we, at some point I'm sure policies and things will be written up about AI usage, but we have to be a little bit more aware of the fact that it's just saying it's plagiarism is not entirely accurate. Um, I know what they are doing at your, your higher education institutions you're required to take screenshots of the conversations that you're having with whatever chatbot you chat model you're using and then attach that as evidence. This is your reference. You're referencing that thing and they helped you to get to that point. Um, so it's an interesting route that some of them are following. So the bottom line is if I look at everything that our teachers responded with and I look at the whole response in its totality, 
um, everything that we that we basically synthesized from this board that we shared with you. Um, the bottom line is, and this is what I the conclusion that I've come come to, talking to the people who are very pro ICT integration, who are doing great things in their classrooms. Honestly, AI has not revolutionized education in WCED much. It really hasn't. Um, we can ask ourselves how much has it revolutionized our own work? How much has it changed what we do? And has it? I'll be the first one to say, like, yes, I use it and it helps. But I mean, it has definitely not revolutionized what I do. It, it kind of po points me in the right direction. Even when I'm struggling with a formula um, in, in a Google Sheet thing, if it's a complicated thing, I'll ask ChatGPT, it'll give me a response. Nine out of 10 times, I'm like, that's not going to work. But it triggers something like, oh, wait, 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 wait. I can use something like that. Okay, that's going to work. But I think it's important to keep this in mind yet. I don't think it's not going to revolutionize education. I think it's going to have a bigger impact than things have. If we think about the TV, TVs didn't replace teachers. It didn't revolutionize education. But a lot of teachers are using video content when they're teaching. A lot of them are not using it correctly because they're just replacing themselves with video content, which doesn't work. But there's no denying that that video content has had a massive impact on learning. 90% of what I am telling you now, or maybe not 90%, let's say, let's say 70% of what I'm talking about in this thing is based off of those hype videos that we spoke about. These videos that we that we looked at here in the beginning, like a lot of what I'm talking about is based off of that. Um, but at the same time, but at the same time, there's a big chunk of what I'm talking about now that is based off of conversations I've had with other people who've also watched those videos, where we rationalize and discuss and talk about it. And I think that is the that is the most important step for us in WCED moving forward is to have these conversations. The other thing that I see is happening um, at, a, at a quite a quick rate um, that is also quite interesting to keep an eye on. AI integrating into known edtech tools. So what we are seeing now is we've, we've seen for the past year, it's kind of like ChatGPT came out. Everyone got excited about generative AI. Everyone jumped on it, and millions of new tools got developed. Like, there are new tools every day. Half of them do exactly the same, but it's a new thing. So everyone's kind of jumping on the bandwagon and trying to find their little niche, their thing that they can do. You've got things like Conquer, Magic School. Um, these things didn't exist previously. But what is now happening is I think AI or the big companies in edtech your companies like Kahoot, an old established edtech company, Quizlet, established one, Quizzes, it's an established tool. It's been used for a long time. Formative, these are established tools. They are now integrating AI into their platforms, um, which is just enhancing it. And they've got money to throw out the problem. The other thing that's also happening from a from a from an, an administrative side is. You've got Copilot from Microsoft, which is, I don't know how, to what extent it is available on our devices yet. Yes, Hafiz, I see you've got your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to remind you of times. So we have about yep. Yep, 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 yep. I know. eight don't minutes worry. left. And I have a question or I'm two actually to almost ask done. as well. Cool. Okay. Right. Do you have a question as well? Yeah, I'm going to add in a question them. or two. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, these tools are now integrating integrating AI into what they're doing. You've got Google that are integrating that 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 are actively integrating AI into their tools as well. In the back end, a lot of it is not available yet, but there's a lot of work from the big companies. There's also a lot of crazy stuff happening. The CEO of ChatGPT is gone. He's left. He's joined Microsoft now. But now ChatGPT the open AI, the company, now they're all basically in revolution saying they're all going to quit unless he comes back. So who knows? And they're the guys leading the charge in this thing. And other people are trying. It's We don't know what's happening. But the simple fact is there's a lot of money being thrown around, and that means development. Now, last time I said 
edtech wants to monetize AI, and they still want to monetize AI, but because there are so many new tools out there, they've also realized they can't do it as aggressively as they initially wanted to. Um, so maybe less so. They want to monetize it, but they've also realized, ah, we can't do it quite as much as we wanted to make money off of it. Um, and the whole thing is settling down a little bit, and it's going to be interesting to see where we are in a year's time. I'm hoping there's a little bit more conversation and a little bit more infusion into our schools in a year's time as more people start playing around with what it can do. And we, as district and head office officials, as the office-based um, side of things, we have to be the ones that are sparking that curiosity because it's curiosity that will get us there. I'm going to end off with the same quote that I ended off last time because I still feel it is just as valid and relevant as it was then, and I think it's going to be relevant and valid going forward as well, and that is generative AI brings with it the potential to make us the most efficient we've ever been at executing an inefficient education system, but it also brings with it the potential to completely disrupt and reshape education for the better. And that's that's it. I'll just leave that up there. And that's it, Khafisa. <laughs> awesome, awesome, Yaku. I think it just because our time is so limited right now. I just want to bring attention to some some um, comments that were made. Um, I think a lot of our participants here, the audience had indicated a number of comments, especially Alma Ria said some amazing things. Um, I want to bring one when she mentions you're close to the end that we need to look at how to guide our teachers to give AI the correct prompts and guide the conversations that you're having with AI. Um, she downloads the conversations and edits it as she goes along to learn from her conversation. It is part of the problem solving and critical engagement. And I think what would be really good, I think um, Crystal had also um, supported this notion because looking at our taxonomy and looking at thinking skills and how that can all be related to gen to engineer prompting. And this is something that we can look at in the new year as well in terms of um, guiding our teachers, guiding learners, um, guiding you know all stakeholders within education in terms of that kind of um, engineering, prompt engineering, which we know is also going to be soon a job on the market, you know? Um, I think it's already a, a job. Prompt engineer. So. Yeah. So um, we also, um, I think it was Alzet or Hussein, the use, Alzet indicated the use of calculators in schools was believed to be um, at the time to discourage learners to think. So we've had, like you had said, with the TV calculators, or we've had previous um, technologies coming in that may have just shifted the paradigm completely and we all feared that people would think less and you know with the automated systems that we have now if we're thinking about the instant gratification of technology that technology brings us as well and we think about cons consumption with television <laughs> there is already a little bit of less thinking happening i think our our new iterative way of moving forward is to help people to think about how they are thinking through the things that they are consuming. <laughs> and I know that's a big statement to make, but I do believe that that is a way that we're going to have to move forward because um, as Clinton, uh, Mr. Walker mentioned here, anti-road learning may have decimated the ability to do mental calculations. And so there's a lot that we need to maybe unpack and there's big explorations that can come from this. But I had one question. Actually, I had a few, but I'm going to ask you one question before we end off. And um, it might be a big question. You might not even have the answer for me, but I think it's something we can all think about, you know? So what is the ideal? Like, what would be the ideal landscape of education if we infused AI? And what kind of professional development would we need if AI was wholly confused, oh, confused, <laughs> infused in education, and it was part of everything that we are doing. What did that ideal look like? I know it's a big question, but it's just on your opinion, just on your thought basis right now, and it's something we can maybe think about as well. Look, I, I love the idea of, uh, and I mean this, I think the context is also important, my background as being a an English teacher in that sense is important, but like I love the idea of AI being a buddy that you can brainstorm with um, mm. from, a, from a learner's side. So, so I think 
it's it's we have to understand that there are two elements of infusion ha happening with AI. We've got the infusion on the teacher side and the infusion on the learner side. So on the learner side, I love the fact that you potentially have like a buddy that you can brainstorm with and check things with, because we also need to be mindful of the fact that if you go into the real world, you, you're going to be allowed to use these tools. And if you know how to use these tools effectively, you will just simply be a better worker, regardless of what you're doing. If you've got like an idea, this is my idea, any things that I could improve, maybe think about this. It just engages critical thinking. So I like that idea. From a teacher's mm. side, I'm not at all against the fact that it's making the admin load less. Because if the admin load is less, and if the if you can use AI to help you generate tests and help you generate content and help you generate the quizzes, I mean, this I didn't even get to show you this this tool. Well, I think it's a super cool tool because you can create the question and just export it into any type of platform that you're using. But anyway, that's a, I didn't get around to that. But it helps a teacher have less admin, get content done quicker, all of those things, which makes your teacher a happier teacher. And a happier teacher is a better teacher. Absolutely. An exhausted, overworked teacher is not a good teacher. If you can take burden off of them, they will improve, that will improve the quality measurably. So from Excellent. a teacher's side, takes the, can take the burden off. From a learner's side, you basically have a buddy who knows everything and is always willing to brainstorm mm. ideas with you. That That's the way, ideal way of it moving forward that I see. Awesome. I just want to add a disclaimer to everyone. Yaku used me in many examples and also indicated that I do not respond to him on many occasions. This is untrue. That was an AI generative response. Um, before we close off, our director, Mr. Hawke, is in the session as well. I have allowed his mic. Mr. Hawke, if you have our final, this is our last Empower Hour for 2023. If you just want to add your voice in our session, um, you've added a lot of comments and questions, and we love it. So please come in and just give uh, your feedback or your thoughts on the matter of AI before we end of our session. Totally on the spot, Mr. Walker. <laughs> you can put I'll give you, I can put your camera on if you want that too. Mr. Walker, you there? In, Mr. Walker. I see he's in the chat, but His camera and his mic is still off. Your mic is on. Can you switch your mic on? Oh, his mic is on. My mic is on. Hi yeah. there, everybody. This is the real me. <laughs> Believe me. Take my word for it. I would not lie. Any comments, Mr. Walker, on this topic before we close off the session? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually speaking on the on the topic as being an, an avatar. It's um well-crafted, um, Yako, it's an extremely topical um, debate that's going on. And I think the more we play with it, grapple with it, the greater our understanding as well. So maybe part of what we should be looking at going forward is creating some of those little playgrounds, either through our SAPs and, and by extension to teachers, to have playgrounds that people actually sit and then do put in these prompts. It can be quite a fun exercise at the same time. Um, time often escapes us, but I think if we want to gain one hour, we have to put in 10 hours of work so we're able to incrementally gain an hour over time. Over a period of a year, we'll see how much time we have gained. But in these starting moments, regrettably, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy that needs to be put in. So thank you to you, um, Jaco, for leading some of that um, thinking processes and doing some of the hard and heavy lifting for us. Uh, we need to catch up. And maybe um, you can assist us in catching up and actually doing some some uh, some playing on online as well and, and doing it in real time. Thanks, Christina. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, um, Yaku. I just want to say thank you to you for having this engaging conversation with all of us, um, for expanding it so so far, and also really bringing in the teachers' voices as well. Um, I think this has been quite an impactful one. I think next year we have quite a um, 
a job on our hands as well as a team to be able to also share forward in terms of AI and the potential thereof and also to guide teachers in this process. Um, this has been really an exciting year in terms of Empower Hour. We're looking forward to the new year when we're moving into our season four. Um, the recording of the session will be available within next week on our ePortal. We do have a page on the ePortal. You can watch all previous Empower Hours that have happened season one, season two, and season three over the last three years. Um, have a fantastic year, everyone. This has been such a an incredible year. It's been a momentous year. It's been a challenging year. It's been a crazy year. I read this, this quote yesterday and I was just like, yes, the amount of times I yawed at yo this year is yo. So like, it has just been a year of unending things happening and it's constantly still happening. I mean, we're still challenged right now. So I just want to again say thank you to every single one. And I'm, I'm realizing my camera is not even on. So we've uh, let me just put my camera on to say goodbye. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone that has supported the Empower Hour over this last year and that has also really given the inputs and the guidances around this. We will be reaching out more in terms of our curriculum foci next year. That is our intent for Empower Hour Season 4. And I'm just, um, I'm just grateful and it's been an exciting year and I wish you everything of the best, everyone, over the last stretch of 2020. 2023 over the holiday period as well and i hope that your year ends with with great enthusiasm and inspiration for 2024 coming in yaku thank you again my buddy my friend my colleague and my partner in crime um always and always you and i you just you just make everything so much faster and cooler and better and i just thank you very much for your inputs that you have brought to the table of empower hour this year thank you so very much and thank you for everyone sharing the things in the comments right now i love it love it love it love it and <laughs> um final words from you yaku no just thank you very much and yo <laughs> A big yo from all, yo, 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 and yo. So yes, everyone have a fantastic, fantastic weekend and enjoy the rest of this year. And I'm wishing you a safe return into 2024. Thank you, everyone. Good, goodbye. <laughs>